Hello, hi, a very, very happy good evening. So this is Krishna Veni, and we're talking about the story of life on Earth, and that's biology. So welcome to my new beginning. So today we are starting a very beautiful, very interesting, with a lot of confusion. So this unit is very beautiful, I would say. So that is introduction to genetics. So we are talking about class twelve chapter. So we are going to talk about a class 12 unit that is genetics and evolution. So we are starting with the first unit of your genetics so that is principles of inheritance and variation. So usually students find this unit pretty tough because it has a lot of concepts to understand, a lot of uh, crosses to do, a lot of percentage to understand. So at the end of this chapter you have what is called as genetic disorders which is also a bit confusing. That is why students always feel this chapter is as very heavy as very tough but it is ideally not like that it is a very very interesting one if you pay attention if you love the subject and if you understand the logic so don't worry so here I, I'm here to uh, simplify the concepts for you so Ashwin Raj hello so thank you so much for joining us today so you have already texted before the lecture when will the live class be started okay so the live class is supposed to begin at 4 I'm really for, uh, sorry for being a couple of minutes late Fine, for all those who are watching this class, so please do like, share and subscribe. So thank you so much for joining my session. So please lend us your support of letting people know about this platform where I take the entire biology and it's a pre free platform, right? And everyone is able to access. So please do join me for this session. Fine, so since uh, I had uh, comments where people told me, ma'am, genetics is particularly tough. So here I am to help you all. So let's go into today's lecture. Fine. So now we are going to talk about the first chapter in this unit that is principles of inheritance and variation. So before that, ma'am, why do you find genetics interesting but we from the student community feel genetics very tough? So probably for the students that I, whom I have taught, so after I have completed genetics, after I have solved enough numericals for them, so after I have solved enough critical thinking questions for them, so the review that I got from students was that ma'am, yes, genetics is genuinely interesting. So probably once you understand the notch that is present or the twist or the, what do you say, uh, the essence of this chapter, so I guess it is really, really interesting, so don't worry. Before that, what is genetics? What is hereditary? What is inheritance? Ma'am, we don't know the basic meaning of these English words from the English point of view. What is genetics? What is hereditary? What is inheritance? So don't worry, so I'm here to elaborate everything. And I'm also here to make things very, very simple. So let's see how it moves and how it goes on. And please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. So here we go. So what do you mean by genetics? So why is genetics interesting or why is genetics tough? So what is the way and how it moves? Yes, ma'am, a very, very happy good evening. So thank you so much for joining us today. So please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. All right. So genetics. So under this term genetics, so before I define genetics for you, so let's talk about hereditary. So what is hereditary? So sometimes you say no, it is in the genes. I have this, I have this qual quality or the character because my dad has it. So I, so it is, it runs in our blood, it runs in our veins, right? So that means something is getting passed down from one generation to the other generation. So you have inherited it from your parents, right? So that is you, you have carried it on because that has been come from your parents. So that is called as inheritance. But here let's talk about hereditary. So hereditary is transmission of characters, resemblance as well as differences from the parental generation to the offspring. So from one generation to the other, your characters are getting passed down and that is hereditary. But you come from your mother and father, but you do not look exactly like your mother or father. So we are not Xerox copies, but we have similarities with them. We also have differences with them, right? So I might resemble my mother and father, but I am not exactly identical to them. There are some differences in the appearance, in the resemblance from my mother and father, right? So no individual, no two individuals are exactly alike. Even identical twins have differences. So uh, to look, uh, for an instant they might look similar, but they might look same, but they are not, okay? 
So this transmission of characters, so what is getting transmitted from one generation to the other? So what is the resemblance? What is the difference? What is the similarity from the parental generation to the offspring? So that is your hereditary. So now, what is genetics? The study of hereditary. So I have defined what is hereditary. Now I am defining what is genetics. So this study of hereditary wait, variations and the environmental factors responsible for these is known as your genetics. Okay. Yeah, the word genetics was coined or described by Mr. William Bateson. So yes, so we all are a mix, of, we are all a mix or a hybrid of your mother and father, right? So we have everything combined. So we are a perfect combination of your mother and father. So what is getting this, what is getting combined? So which is actually coming down? For example, let's say your mom has uh, brown eyes. So you have inherited the brown eyes. So some information is being passed down, right? So that is what I'm trying to say. So that is your, that is what we're going to study. That is inherited, right? So now something is getting inherited and that is why you look like your mother. So you and I look different because my parents, my, so my, the genes that I carry are different. The genes that you carry are completely different, right? Fine, so he is Mr. William Bateson who helped us use the term today that is genetics. So let's move forward. So we will discuss what is, so this is a pretty huge chapter. So this is important from your term 1 point of view. So that is TBSC term 1 as well as from your NEAT exam point of view. So uh, we will discuss Mendel's experiments. So because here the hero is Griha George Mendel. So in science, so we have heroes. The heroes here are scientists. So everything you can compare it to movies, so that's no difference. So you have a hero, you have a villain. So you have the struggles the heroes face. And the final successful thing is that result that we have. And that is what we are studying today. So today we are going to talk about Mendel's experiments. So this is principles of inheritance and variation chapter. So we are going to talk about Mendel's experiment. We are going to talk about inheritance of one gene. So what are the laws of Mendel laws one and two? So we will stop here. We will not go further. So in this chapter, but we will continue with incomplete dominance. We will continue with co-dominance, inheritance of two genes. Law of independent assortment. So, all these are the topics that we are going to discuss in this chapter. Ma'am, the topic itself looks pretty complicated. So, don't worry. The chapter isn't this complicated. Uh, so, let's move forward. So, classical genetics, that is Mendel's principle. So, genetics is a very, very vast field. So, the genetics that we know today is not the entire genetics that is existing. The genetics that we know today is just one speck of the entire ocean or the vast volume of genetics that is exactly present. We are not able to identify more. We are still under research. We are still studying. We are still exploring into the field of genetics. How and why? What is happening? So you have the new variant of Corona that is your Omicron. Right, so it has a lot of mutations. It is a variant. Why? What is wrong? Because of its genetic material, right, and its ability to interact with our DNA. So now, how this is happening? So the backbone is genetics, right? So you should know the structure. You should know how, which, when is passed down. Or there is a lot more to know about genetics. So genetics is a particular subject. So just like you have biology as a subject, so genetics in masters or in higher level is a separate subject. So under this subject, you have various subclassifications. So you have um, what to say uh, epigenetics. You have a lot of things under genetics itself, right? So genetics is very very huge, and we are going to talk. We are not going to talk about the entire thing all nine. So what is mentioned in your NCRT is just you can say just. 0.2% of the entire genetics that we know and that 0.2% is important for the basics to understand further. So today genetics is very important so you guys after becoming doctors would definitely need the support of genetics to go further because very soon we'll enter into an era of personalized medicine because the paracetamol that you eat and the, paras the same paracetamol if I eat so I have I can have complications. So according to each person's genome so what is a gene? genome, the set of genes in a person. So the d tablets can vary, the treatment can vary. So for every doctor, genetics is very important. And genetics is the backbone, you can say, for everything. So today, if we are able to find uh, vaccines very quickly, that is because of genetics. If you're not able to find vaccines very quickly,
quickly so that is also because we have not advanced forward in genetics we still need more data so that is what it signifies all right fine so your genetics is divided into three basic types so one is classical genetics the other one is molecular genetics and the last one is population genetics so you have three varieties of genetics okay so classical genetics so classical means the old age so from the root ancient one so the classical genetics we call it as the mendelian genetics because griher george mendel in the 19th century came forward with the concept of gene right so it started from there how the information is getting passed down from the parental generation to the offspring so that is your classical genetics all right so moving further we have molecular genetics so molecular genetics talks about the structure of your genetic material that is the structure of dna so how dna came into being so how your dna replicates transcribes and translates all right so moving further the third one is population genetics so it talks about how in a population the gene frequency the genome everything varies all right so these are the three categories of genetics um hello shashank so yes a very very happy good evening so it's nice to see you here on this platform so thank you once again for joining us so please don't forget to like share and subscribe so shashank i hope your exams are going on and you have done your exams well so thank you for remembering my class and coming so thank you once again fine so from the three classes or three types of genetics that we have so today we are going to talk about the first type so that is the classical genetics so which is in another way called as the mendelian genetics so here the hero is griher george mendel so i guess you would have seen this picture or you would have seen this man before yeah he so this is him so this is griher george mendel so today uh he is known as the father of classical genetics or genetics itself so he worked from he was active from, uh, since the era 1822 to 1884 so that is when he was active and that is when he did his experiments so mendel did a statistical studies he did not do a normal experiment so he did a statistical study so what was his experiment what did he use we will see in the upcoming slides okay so he discovered that the individual traits inherited as discrete factors which retain the physical identity in a hybrid ma'am well the english is pretty complicated we don't understand so to put it in a simple word so something from the mother is passed on to the daughter or to the son so he called that which is passing from one generation to the other generation as discrete factors which later came to be known as genes so initially he did not use the term genes because genes was coined by mr william bateson so he said that something is getting passed on from the parental generation to the offspring but that something is known as the discrete factor so later this discrete factor was named to be known as or coined it was coined as genes okay hello divyansh hello so thank you so much for joining me today so that's really great to see you guys here so please don't forget to like share and subscribe so i guess this chapter is of very much use to you yes fine so not bad so i have chosen the right unit this evening fine so these are genes and this is a very short introduction so today we know them as genes and genes are defined as a unit of heredity that may influence the outcome of organism's trait so um what is a trait what is a character i will explain hold on so as of now i hope you remember this okay sandwich so are you having a sandwich okay fine so i got it okay so let's move forward so now let's talk about spism sativum so something that griher george mendel did had an outstanding influence on what we call genetics today or in the field of genetics so he spoke about discrete factors that was getting transmitted from the parental generation to the offspring right so this is known as your gene today but in which experiment or with what material did he perform his experiment so what did he study and how did he find out all this so he used what is called as spism sativum so spism sativum is your garden pea i guess you'd have know you you guys would have heard about it so mendel performed his experiments with the garden pea plant so that is spism sativum right so why did he choose this plant of all So your Griher George Mendel was an Austrian monk okay so he lived in his monastery so one more reason why he chose your uh, spicum sativum was that 
So that was the plant that was easily available in the gardens of the monastery. But well, not necessarily that was the only reason. But your spicum sativum had well-defined discrete characters. So what do I mean by well-defined discrete characters? So if I look into the plant, I can easily identify the stem, the root, the leaf, the flower, the bud, etc. So it was proper. So nothing was combined. So nothing was lost. So everything was proper. So it was a complete plant for him to choose for his experiment. Okay. So well-defined discrete character. So it had bisexual flowers. So bisexual means both male and female flowers were present in the plant. So predominant fertilization, so if it's a bisexual flower, there's possibility of self-fertilization as well. So then EC hybridization, so it was easy to cross-pollinate also, so that was also possible. And last of all, it was easy to cultivate and it had relatively short life cycle. So we didn't have to pay a lot of attention or break our minds on how to cultivate it. So it was pretty simple and it had a relatively short life cycle. <coughs> Sorry, if it had a relatively short life cycle, it means I can grow many generations in study. Say for example, the entire lifespan of the spicum sativum gets over in six months. So in one year, I can study two generations, right? So if the entire life cycle is uh, is taken for three months, so then I can study how many generations? I can literally study almost four generations, right? Ma'am, is this for neat or both? So right now I'm teaching the concept, so it can be for both, it can be for NEAT. I'm not solving questions, but the concepts are same for NEAT as well as both. Okay? Yeah. So this is the reason why he chose Spicum sativum. So guys, you have to remember, Griha George Mendel is the father of genetics and he spoke about discrete factors which is getting passed on from the parental generation to the offspring. And he chose Spicum sativum for his experiments. Why? The reasons are given below. So what are the characters studied by Mendel? So when I say he chose the Spicum sativum, what characters in Spicum sativum did he choose? Because it's a complete plant. So it has hundreds of characters. So which character did he study? For example, if I choose a rat for my experiment. So what are the characters or the features of the rat that I want to study? Say I want to study about the rat tail, I want to study about the rat heart, the rat liver. So I have specifications, right? So mental would also have chosen certain characters or certain specifications. What are they? So Mendel chose seven characters that he wanted to study from the pea plant. Okay, so he chose seven pairs of characters. Ma'am, why do you say seven pairs of characters? Because Character and trait have a difference. So he chose seven characters, but the trait that he studied was 14 traits. So for example, when I say height of the plant is a character. So I am concerned about the height of a plant, which is a character, right? So the plant can either be tall or dwarf. It can be tall enough or it can be short enough, right? So every character has two possibility. Right. So if I say his character is dynamic, so he can be very active or he can be very lazy either way. Right. So in every character, I have two options which I could choose or which is actually existing. So character is a broad term. The contrasting options of a character is called as a trait. So Mendel chose seven characters and 14 traits for his experiment to study about the discrete process or the discrete factor. So here are the characters and the traits chosen by Mendel. So if you see, Mendel chose seven characters, right? So the first character is seed shape. The first character is seed shape. The second character is seed color. The third character is pod shape. The fourth character is pod color. The fifth character is flower color. The sixth one is flower location. And seventh one is plant size. So these are the characters studied by Mendel. Okay. Hello Pio. She has a very, very happy good evening. So thank you for joining my session today. So please do like, share and subscribe. So I hope this is the last round of revision for you guys. Right. So these are the characters. So once again, each character has two opinions, right? It has two options that it can take. So if I say the, so for example, the height, if I say, explain again. Okay. So 
we are talking about characters and hi hi shimpi yes a very very happy good evening yes i'm doing good how are you it's so nice to see you here today how come you came for my class today no school so anyways thank you so much for remembering me so please don't forget to like share and subscribe shimpi fine so mendel chose spicum sativum and the reasons we have discussed in the previous slide now in the spicum sativum what are the characters that he studied so the characters that he studied are listed here but each character can have two contrasting options right so when i say height of a plant is a character right so it can have either tallness or dwarfness right so that is height so when i say height i can have two options for height one is tallness one is dwarfness right so this contracting a uh, contrasting option is my trait so seed shape seed color pot shape pot color flower color flower location plant size is my character okay so now under seed shape the seed can either be round or wrinkled so these are my traits fine so your seed shape can be round or wrinkled your seed color can be yellow or green your pot shape can be inflated or constricted pot color can be green or yellow your flower color can be purple or white your flower location can be axial or terminal your plant size can be tall or dwarf so you have seven characters or seven pairs of trait or 14 traits that was studied by mendel okay ah uh, sheriff hello so hi shimpi also okay fine so thank you who are you are so please do like share and subscribe yes yeah, so uh, how is munna shimpi good fine so i hope you understood character and trait yes uh, divyan should you understand character and trait fine so the characters of an organism are described as characters or traits and when mendel studied them so we call it as mendelian characters okay so you have come to see me wow that's really great so thank you so i am happy that you remember me good so i hope your studies are going well so please take care and thank you once again fine so now moving to the next concept so that is your alleles so what are alleles so the genes which code for a pair of contrasting traits or slightly different forms of the same gene so when i say i have a gene so what is a gene so first we'll go from the basic so we have your dna which is your genetic material so a portion on the dna that codes for a sensible product is known as your gene so genes are present on your dna your dna is packed as chromosomes fine so now when i say on my dna i have a gene that codes for height so this is the sequence that is coding for my height right so it can either code for tallness or dwarfness right so i have two pairs or two contract uh, contrasting options for a particular gene itself right so that is my allele so alleles are contra alleles are a code alleles are a pair okay so which code for a contrasting trait or slightly different forms of the same gene so see tallness and dwarfness are the same form are the different forms of a same gene right yes so this is known as your alleles fine okay so let's move forward so your alleles can be of two type one is wild type and the other one is mutant type yes shimpi i can understand that's completely fine uh, but anyways still thank you it was happy it was really good to see you here fine so i am looking dull okay so i am tired of teaching you guys so that is why i am looking dull fine so shimpi is my old student so she used to come for my previous batch of lead fine yeah So now, what is wild type? What is mutant type? So the most um, uh, number of alleles that is present in a population is known as a wild type. So the widely present, uh, widely existing alleles in a population is called as a wild type. For example, when you talk about the character height, right? So majority of the Indians are of a moderate height. So no one is dwarf or not. We are not. We are not either very tall, right? So our alleles are average. So we have an intermediate famous population in, across India, right? 
So, this is your wild type, okay. So, wild type are the prevalent alleles in a population. So, in a mutant, mutant means which is present in less than 1% in the population, which is very, very minimal, okay. So, wild type and mutant allele. So, what is dominant and recessive allele? Okay. So, dominant and recessive allele. So, dominant allele is the one which dominates the other one. So, if I have two bullies, one is Divyant and one is Shashank. So, the dominant one will always dominate and the other one will always be quiet, right? So, that is your dominant allele, but your dominant alleles are represented by uppercase, okay? So, your dominant, allele, so always remember alleles are in a pair. So, alleles are never one. So, it is always in a pair. Okay, so recessive alleles which is always silent, which is expressed only when it is alone, right? So recessive alleles are always present in lower case, fine? So yeah, this is your dominant allele which is trying to bully, okay? So now you're going to talk about homozygous and heterozygous, fine? So I told you this is our DNA and on the DNA, we have a particular sequence that codes for a particular product. So, this is known as your gene, right? So, say for example, I have a gene that codes for height. So, a gene will have alleles, right? So, the alleles are a pair. Say for example, the allele that, uh, for example, person A or Shashank has this allele. So, the allele is capital T, small t, okay? So, capital T, small t is known as your heterozygous condition. So, imagine, uh, sorry, always understand alleles are in pairs. So, alleles are like this, okay. So, if it is like this, then the person would be tall. So, let me tell you again. So, these are different forms of an allele. So, this is your dominant one because it is written in uppercase. So, this is your dominant allele. Fine. So, this is written in lowercase. So, this is your recessive allele. So, now if it is written like this, this is heterozygous. But even then, the dominant one will always play a role. So, this is tallness condition. Okay. Fine. So, dominant allele, recessive allele and this is tallness. Okay. So, this is your heterozygous condition. Look, if you want to listen, listen, but don't spam around here, fine? So, if you're listening, fine, and if you have a genuine doubt, you ask me, I will explain, but you will not spam around here, right? Yes, so this is your homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. So, since the pair of alleles are of the same type, capital T, capital C, this is dominant allele. So, bones are, since both are small t, small t, this is homozygous condition, this is homozygous recessive. So, capital T, tall t is heterozygous because you have two different varieties here. So, I hope you guys have understood what is an allele. So, allele is the uh, two forms of the same gene, okay. So, you have each parent has two alleles for a trait. For example, your parent, your father might have this, your mother might have this. So, now you will inherit and it will come in your gene. So, which one comes? That is pretty random. Okay. So, this is how the alleles are. So, homozygous when two identical alleles are present, that is homozygous. So, heterozygous dominant or heterozygous recessive, it can be or it can be, uh, sorry, this is homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive and this is heterozygous type. Fine. Yeah, so if I write like this, this is homozygous dominant, this is heterozygous and this is homozygous recessive. So, let's move forward. So, inheritance of one gene. So, this is how your Mendel started his work. So, he worked on your spisum sativum. So, I guess by now it is clear. So, he chose two parents. So, one tall parent and one dwarf parent. So, when he cross-pollinated them, so in the first generation, he got a tall child. He got a tall offspring. So, this tall offspring was again pollinated with a similar plant. So, in the F2 generation, he got four offsprings. Three were tall and one was dwarf. So, this was the experiment that Mendel performed. So, this is inheritance of one gene. So, once again, so Mendel did this experiment. So, he took one tall plant and one dwarf plant, okay. So, 
when he cross pollinated them he got a tall plant so he cross pollinated again with a similar type of plant and he had four offsprings so this is this was the first experiment that your mendel performed so from this experiment he concluded that the f1 generation resembled one of the parent so the f1 generation was tall right so this resembled this parent so the f1 generation definitely resembled one of the parent and the f2 generation was identical to the parent type but in the f2 generation though you had four offsprings tall 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 and dwarf so they are all of the parental type right so this is the parental type this is f1 generation type okay so here you have your f2 generation but they have resembled this parental type there is no intermediate variation yes divyansh coming to that so here there is no intermediate of blending so which means to say i do not have a plant of intermediate height so i have a parent who's tall and dwarf so the offsprings are either tall or dwarf there is no intermediate there is no plant which is of the intermediate height right so mendel said something is being stably passed unchanged from one generation to the other so in f1 generation i never got a dwarf plant right but in the f2 generation i am getting a dwarf plant meaning something is getting passed down from one generation to the other so this is what mendel coined as discrete factors so since only one character that is height is concerned this is your mono hybrid cross all right yeah so here the parents are tall and dwarf so always tallness is dominant so we write this as capital t capital t dwarfness is recessive fine so these are the parents and these are the alleles of the parents so alleles are always in a pair right so now we have to find the gametes so since this is homozygous both are of the same type so one of them will be the gamete there is no competition so this is also homozygous so one of them will be the gamete okay so here the parents will be sorry here the offsprings will be so this is offspring of the f1 generation so this is capital t small t okay so this fellow will be tall so now i am doing selfing so i cross it with a similar type of plant so now i will have to find the gametes so here finding the gametes is a bit problematic because it is heterozygous it is not homozygous like this so here capital t capital t was there so i picked up one capital t but here i have one capital t and one small t so now how do i find the gametes so i write capital t small t so for this parent i write capital t small t so now i will do the crossing so capital t capital t so capital t small t do the crossing again so this is tall this is also tall this is also tall and this is dwarf right so this is the inheritance of one gene so this is how you write in the form of alleles so now here here you have to understand two terms what is phenotypic ratio and what is genotypic ratio so phenotypic ratio so it means based on physical observation so phenotypic p physical observation of physical character p again so if you look at it physically so directly if i look at the plant i can see three tall plants and one dwarf plant right so i have three tall plant is to one dwarf plant so this is nothing but 3 is to 1 so this is my ratio which i can see it with my eyes so this is 3 is to 1 phenotypic ratio but genotypic ratio is the genetic ratio but if you look at the alleles these two alleles are same this is heterozygous this is homozygous dominant this is homozygous recessive so i have three types of alleles here so i have homozygous dominant i have heterozygous i have homozygous recessive so it is 1 is to 2 is to 1 so this is my genotypic and phenotypic ratio for inheritance of one gene 
Now, answering your question, Divyansh, what is a test cross? So, for a test cross, a test cross is usually done to find the exact genotype of the offspring or to where or to which parent the offspring closely resembles. That is a test cross. Okay. So, you take the F1 offspring. Capital T small t is our F1 offspring and you cross it with the recessive parent. So, when you cross the F1 offspring with the recessive parent, so that is your test cross. So, this is our recessive parent. So, this is test cross, okay? Yes. So, now how do you find the gametes here? So, here the gamete can be capital T, small t because it is heterozygous. So, from these two the gamete is small t. So, here, so it is 50 percent tall and it is 50 percent dwarf. So, here the phenotypic ratio is 1 is to 1 because 1 is tall, 1 is dwarf. The genotypic ratio is 1 is to 1. So, 1 heterozygous, 1 homozygous recessive. So, the plant is more close or it is an intermediate. To find this is a heterozygous condition. So, this is your test cross. Alright? Yes? A test cross is a way to explore the genotype of an organism. Yeah, kind of right. So, this is my offspring. Right. So, if I cross it with a recessive parent, I get to know which were my parents. So, here I say 50 percent is like this, 50 percent is like this. So, the parents were half tall, half dwarf. So, here one parent was tall, one parent was dwarf. Right. So, that is what I am trying to explain. Early use of test cross was an experimental mating test used to describe what alleles are present in the genotype exactly. So, that is what I am looking for. In a test cross, you find the alleles present in the genotype. So, for example, if this is my offspring, right? So, I want to find the genotypes of the parent. So, that is also the reason I can find. I also want to find to which parent the plant is closely related, right? Fine. Uh, okay, so Google say copy ke, yes, it is understood because it is properly framed without any correction. Yeah, so this is your text cross. So now, inheritance of one gene, so whatever I have told you in the form of gametes is written here. So in the F2, in the F2 generation, so we are using a square like this to make the cross, right, to find out the offsprings. But here you understand, since in the F1 generation, since there was nothing for dwarf plant, there was no phenotypic expression of the dwarf plant, but still here in the F2 generation, your dwarf plant was formed, right? So here, this T and this T segregate independent of each other. And this square is your Purnet square. It is a graphical representation to find the genotype of the offspring. So, test cross, when the F1 progeny is crossed with a recessive parent, you have 50% dominant and 50% recessive. So, back cross, what is a back cross? If the F1 individuals are crossed with any of their parents, okay? So, all test crosses are back crosses. So, F1 individuals are crossed with any of their parent to find which parent is genetically closer to the offspring in the original cross. Okay. So, if I cross it with any of the parent, I know which to which parent the offspring is closer to. But if I do a test cross, I can find the genotype of the organism, the type of alleles present in the organism. So, this is my back cross and my test cross. So, based on this inheritance of one gene, Mendel gave us laws. The laws of Mendel are called as law of inheritance. So, first law is law of dominance. When a parent with pure contrasting traits are crossed together. So, pure contrasting traits means the plants in the homozygous condition. So, I have the plants as capital T and small t. So, this is homozygous dominant. This is homozygous recessive. So, when it is homozygous, you call it as pure contrasting traits or cross together. Only one form of the trait appears in the next generation. So, when I did a cross of these two, I only got tallness in the next generation, right? So, that is what is being said here. 
the hybrid of spring will always exhibit the dominant trait in the phenotype so if it is like this it will not be half tall and half dwarf it will be completely tall because of the dominant allele right so this is your first law of dominance so each character is controlled by distinct units called factors that occur in pairs so if the pairs are heterozygous one will always dominate the other so f1 generation only one parental phenotype uh, phenotype is expressed so if i do like this sorry capital t capital t small t small t so the offspring is this right so only one parental type is expressed here fine so now moving on to the next law so the law of segregation so this is also based on inheritance of one gene so law of segregation <coughs> so let's see what are they during the formation of gamete each gene variant separates from each other so that only one allele will be present in the gamete so if i have in the f1 if i am doing selfing so now either this can segregate independently of each other or this can segregate independently of each other but the gamete will have any one of the allele alone so a gamete is haploid it will have only one of the allele it will not have a pair of allele so that is law of segregation so if you see capital t small t capital t small t so these this is my gamete this is my gamete this is my gamete this is my gamete if these two fuse then i have this offspring if these two fuse i have this offspring right so this is law of segregation so today we have discussed what did mendel do what are the experiments that he chose what are the characters what are the traits what is the material that he used why did he choose spicum sativum what is inheritance of one gene what are alleles what are genes etc so then we went on to talk about how inheritance of one gene happened so um then uh, you we also spoke about the laws of mendel so in between i also spoke about back cross and test cross right so these are the topics for today so we'll continue on wednesday so probably on wednesday i will talk about incomplete dominance co dominance then we can move forward with inheritance of two genes and on friday we have a mentee in human physiology but the timing is 4 pm okay ma'am you have co uh, uh, cough ma'am your covid positive wow so which type what type of a doctor are you so if i cough that means covid positive so come to biology class well on time from tomorrow because i have to teach you a lot of basics okay yeah fine so i am coughing because i have taken i am tired of taking classes for your class right so the law of segregation is done right uh, so i guess i have explained all that that is on the slide so this is my last slide so if you genuinely like my way of teaching so please do like share and subscribe so thank you once again for joining my uh, class today so please don't forget to like share and subscribe so since uh, divyansh has written about covid positive so it's a humble request to so, uh, please stay safe because the symptoms of the omicron virus have been out recently they have discovered that you have excess body pain so you have fever so you have um, a stiffness in the body every night so you feel extremely helpless you feel extremely tired so please stay safe so you do not know how lethal it can be but always uh, precaution is better than cure right so please take a uh, precaution uh, please stay safe because the weather is also pretty unpredictable and your exams are going on so please stay safe and i'll meet you on wednesday at 4 pm so until then this is me signing off so take care and bye so thank you for all those who watch my session today Thank you and bye